Previously on the channel, we have discussed the 30 best adventures, in my opinion, for the Dungeons & Dragons game. In contrast, I thought it would be an interesting idea to talk about my least favoured adventures and why I find them less than stellar. Before we start, just remember that subjective opinions are subjective opinions. My opinions do not invalidate yours and vice versa. You may not agree with my picks, and that's fine. And I encourage you to let me know what your picks would be and why in the comments below. Just remember, you're not wrong and neither am I. I'd also like to note that virtually none of these worst adventures cannot be improved and made better with some effort by an enterprising dungeon master. They all have features that can be made to work with a little applied effort. So number 10, B9, Castle Coldwell and beyond. For me, the best creations aspire to stand out as unique in some way. I thoroughly enjoy reading source books, adventures, rules, campaign material and other such game paraphernalia that tries to do something different. Unfortunately, time and time again, gaming material brings a sense of been there, done that to my jaded eyes. Dungeon Module B9, Castle Coldwell and Beyond, published by TSR for the basic Dungeons & Dragons game in 1985, was such a moment. The module itself comprises five short adventures. The first two, which have the characters set out to clear the eponymous castle and its dungeon, already began ringing alarm bells when I first read it as a teenager. The basic premise is that a noble has acquired a monster-infested castle and wants the players to clear it for him. While not exactly the same, this premise has the same general foundation as the celebrated Judge's Guild adventure, Tegel Manor. Except, we are presented with one of the worst castles ever committed to a map in role-playing. So to my mind, Adventures 1 and 2 of B9 present a bland, toothless reduction of the earlier manner and little in the way of apology or remorse. The next two short adventures in B9 are mediocre dungeons, such as a beginning dungeon master might sketch out as their first foray into dungeon design. There's nothing really special here. And worse, the fourth adventure, The Great Escape, even preempts its own problems by including a If the Players Complain paragraph. The fifth and final adventure, The Sanctuary of Elwyn the Ardent, is the module's saving grace. In fact, this could have been a reasonably good basic level adventure if the premise of the sanctuary had been properly developed and the preceding four mediocre offerings discarded to make room for that. The sanctuary has potential. Number nine, Dragon Mountain. Perhaps a controversial one, as this adventure won the Best Role-Playing Adventure Award at Origins in 1993. However, for me, it's one of those over-presented and over-hyped adventures that fail to deliver on the promise offered by the shiny box full of stuff. Yes, the poster maps are nice. Yes, the handouts are pretty. It comes with cardboard stand-up counters, which are cardboard stand-up counters. It has three 64-page books. It says deluxe on the box. It's pretty. And it's a railroad that leads to a dungeon crawl. That pretty much sums it up. Its redemption comes in the fact that some of the encounters, both in the railroad leading to the main dungeon and within the dungeon itself, are pretty good. But in the main, it just does not live up to the glossiness of its presentation. For a boxed adventure with nearly 200 pages to play with, I want spectacular. What I got was some pretty baubles, a handful of interesting encounters and a tedious slog. Number eight. Horde of the Dragon Queen. I have a general issue with most of the campaign-length 5th edition adventure offerings from Wizards of the Coast, in which, with a few exceptions, tend to be railroad stories into which the player characters are inserted, rather than frameworks within which the player characters can forge their own tales. This seems to be a common thing with current adventure design, and not a specific issue with 5th edition, Wizards and their writers. I've mentioned before that such design practices, in my opinion, detract from the principles upon which role-playing was built. The first of these offerings is perhaps the worst offender in this regard. From its opening on, the adventure presents some encounters as little more than video game-esque cutscenes, and the entire adventure revolves around the setup for its sequel, The Rise of Tiamat. The two adventures, 
Horde of the Dragon Queen and The Rise of Tiamat are now collected into a single volume as Tyranny of Dragons. But rather than taint that volume with the narrow path represented by Horde of the Dragon Queen, and because it was many players' introduction to 5th edition, let alone Dungeons & Dragons as a whole, I'm keeping the original volumes as separate entities for our list here. Perhaps lessons were learned, as I cannot recall any of the subsequent Wizards 5th edition campaign adventures repeating the sin of including, but not involving, the player characters in their own escapades. Number 7. Labyrinth of Madness Dungeons & Dragons celebrated its 20th anniversary over 1994 and 1995, and Labyrinth of Madness was part of that celebration. It comprised a 64-page adventure with an accompanying illustration book, along the lines of modules within the old S series, Tomb of Horrors, White Plume Mountain and Expedition to the Barrier Peaks and so on. In fact, it has a semi-official designation as S6, although TSR had stopped using module codes by the time it was released. It was written for high-level characters, 15th level and up, and many of the encounters described are correspondingly not for the faint-hearted. In connection with its 20th anniversary theme, part of the adventure involved collecting 20 sigils from various parts of the dungeon. The design of the dungeon takes into account the vertical as well as the horizontal, and several diagrams are included alongside room descriptions to show how areas ostensibly on different levels of the dungeon connect. I actually like this dungeon. So why, you might ask, is it on my list of worst dungeons? Fair question. The easy answer is that it reads more like a Grimtooth collection of tricks and traps than a dungeon. For those of you that don't know, Grimtooth's Traps was a series of system agnostic books describing traps published from around 1981 by Flying Buffalo, of Tunnels and Trolls fame. The Grimtooth series can still be purchased as PDFs from Flying Buffalo's store on Drive-Thru RPG. Link below. Anyway, I digress. To get back to where we were, I like this dungeon but it appears here because it just feels like someone took a copy of Grimtooth's Traps and wrote an adventure around it. Granted, that's obviously not quite what happened, it just feels that way. If you ever thought uh, the Tomb of Horrors was bad for a trap-filled death palace, then you've never seen this thing. It's also bloody difficult. Now, me being me, that's not necessarily a criticism. Difficult is fine with me. The problem is, with Labyrinth, is that it's more difficult... By this, I mean it is constructed to be difficult, again, no problem there, and then an additional blanket labelled more difficult is thrown over the whole thing. I'm referring here to the 20th anniversary collect the sigils element. The dungeon is a beast without that, and it's an aspect obviously contrived to fit with the anniversary. It's unnecessary. So, Labyrinth of Mad Madness comes in at my number seven on this list for reading too much like a catalogue of misfortunes and for a tacked-on element that turns its difficulty up several notches for no real overall gain, while at the same time being a fun and interesting dungeon to throw at high-level player characters in the hands of reasonably intelligent players. Number six, L3, Deep Dwarven Delve. If you've seen my top D&D adventures video, then you will know that modules L1, The Secret of Bone Hill, and L2, The Assassin's Knot, are among my favourites. So, when the Silver Anniversary commemorative set was announced for 1999, and was to include module L3, Deep Dwarven Delve, touted as the final published first edition module, and written by L-series author Len Nakofka, rest in peace, I was awash with anticipation. And when it arrived, I was underwhelmed. You see, the L series, or at least L1 and L2, and to an extent L4 and L5 that were released later on Dragon's Foot, represent the sort of thing that works best for my own style of sensibilities as a dungeon master. That is, a fairly well-described sandbox for the player characters to explore, with a plot going on in the background that will affect them in some way. How it affects them, and what they do about it, become options to explore and goals to pursue. The sandbox is laid out in L1, in the main, and the plot in L2, and much fun is to be had with the two in combination. So what was I expecting from L3? Why, a, a continuation, in the same mode. At the very least, an extension to the hex maps found in its predecessors. My hope was that it would build on L2 and continue the sandbox background plot combination into the intermediate levels, perhaps 6th to 8th. 
What we got was not a continuation. Its only links to its precursors is that the preamble begins in Restonford, the major town from L1. From there, it's a standard mid-level dungeon unworthy of the other entries in the L series and of the grand title final published first edition module. It's not a particularly bad standard mid-level dungeon. It just doesn't live up to what it could and should have been. For a silver anniversary celebration, a swan song for one of the most beloved editions of Dungeons & Dragons, and as a sequel to an adventure that I hold in such high esteem, it's a poor effort. There is nothing special about this module, and that is the problem. 5. ST1. Up the Garden Path. Well, where to start? So back in 1986, I was a precocious fifth former, which I am told is year 11 in today's UK education system. Please don't ask me what that is in any other system. It's difficult enough trying to keep up with my own native one. However, anyway, I was 15, so work it out from there. In that year, the UK ran an event in Stoke-on-Trent, the National Garden Festival, on land reclaimed from an old steelworks. We went there on a school trip. I can only really remember two things, that there was a lot of plants and, for some reason, the UK division of TSR was represented. Quite how this came to be, I have no idea, but regardless, what resulted was a whimsical commemorative adventure known as Up the Garden Path. The adventure reimagines the festival as an unstable pocket universe that threatens to impose itself with within a larger universe and thereby set off a chain reaction that would destroy the multiverse. So, the stakes aren't too high... The premise is described within 16 pages of someone's mental breakdown, describing the inhabitants of the pocket universe and the actions the player characters can take to bring about the foot that will end it all, consequently saving the multiverse. It's a whimsy, laced with bad puns and dimensional technobabble. The map of the adventure it uses uh, is of the Grand Festival, but weirdly not the official visitor map. Instead, TSR somehow, and for some reason, gained permission to reprint the map used by Michelin, the tyre company, for the event as one of its sponsors. This means that it is, as far as I know, the only map in an official Dungeons & Dragons product to feature the mascot of another company prominently in its artwork. The module was fun at the time, uh, as you could actually, sort of, visit the locations it described in the form of the festival site, and it draws from a very British frame of mind, within the veins of Douglas Adams and Michael Moorcock. But as a product, it was meant to be a throwaway piece of promotion for TSI UK for the festival and subsequently the 1986 Games Day convention. And many people did just that, throw it away. And therein, the origin of the problem that I have with it begins. Let me begin this next diatribe with a statement. I am not a collector. I have collections of things, usually by accident or necessity, but I don't go on quests to track things down or travel through eBay looking for items simply to be able to produce a Facebook post saying that I have them. In fact, I'll go further and say that the collector mindset is one that is alien to me. Things are to be used, read, played with, taken out of their boxes, generally used and abused. A thing that is possessed purely for the sake of possessing it is, to me, similar to a celebrity who is famous for only being a celebrity. Pointless in the long run. Coming back to this throwaway piece of promotion, the current collector's price for an OK copy of this 16-page Michelin Man-infested throwaway slice of whimsical garbage is over $1,500. Now let that sink in. As an adventure... It's awful. You need to be in drugs to appreciate it properly. As an item, it represents everything I disdain about collectors in the markets they walk in. From a practical perspective, this adventure is useless, and yet, for the very reason that it was created as a throwaway piece of garbage, it commands a ridiculous dollar value. To avoid hypocrisy, I won't reveal whether or not I still have a copy that I bought at the festival in 1986, but what I will say is that I had never said it, and I would even be tempted to feed it to a Zippo as a sacrifice to the anti-collector gods if I didn't realise that I'd just be winding the pointless thing's price up even more. Hmm. Well, anyway, each to their own. If you're a collector and collecting makes you happy, all power to you. You keep on doing you, regardless of what this grumpy old git drivels on about. 
Number four, Ghost Tower of Inverness, C2. I'm going to start another one of these brief overviews by saying, yeah, sure, it's on my worst list, but I love it regardless. With that out of the way, let's discuss why it's on my worst list. Quite a few adventures from the first 15 or 20 years or so of Dungeons & Dragons had their origin in tournament play. Classics such as S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, C1, Hidden Shrine of Tamarokan, and the whole A series of Slavers modules began life as tournaments. For most of them, the tournaments can be extracted from the adventure's plot, such as is the case with the aforementioned adventures. This means that, from the more structured and limited format required by tournament play, at least in those days, can blossom an expanded framework upon which to build fun tales of daring do around the game table. With Ghost Tower, though, it's a little harder. This is because the levels of the tower itself are so ingrained in the tournament challenge vein that it is nigh on impossible to see them as anything but. The rooms themselves are very much written as targeted challenges, in a kind of way. There's an escape room, a lateral thinking room, a wit-checking room, a chessboard room. There used to be a lot of chessboard rooms in early Dungeons & Dragons modules, including ones that I scribbled for my friends. The focus of the tower, having a tournament focus, is, of course, highlighted by the inclusion of the tournament scoring. But this is not really the point. The A series of modules included tournament scoring notes, and they have managed to transcend their tournament origins very well. All that being said, why is it on my worst adventures list? Well, exactly because it is too much of a tournament-style adventure to be able to break that mould and establish itself as a useful tool to a DM, making use of published adventures to round out as his players adventuring. And revisiting my opening comment to this section, why do I like it? Because, when run as a tournament, it's a hell of a lot of fun. 3. Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil I won't dwell on this one too much, since I've already done a review of the Temple of Elemental Evil that includes my thoughts on this adventure. But, to summarise, I feel it's a bloated attempt to out Elemental Evil, the original temple, that ends up producing a terrible railroad and an ill-conceived plot. Enough said. Watch the temple video if you want those thoughts expanded on. Number 2. CB1, Conan Unchained. CB2, Conan Against Darkness, RS1, Red Sonja Unconquered. I am a fair fan of the Hyborian Age, having consumed most works in literature, films and comics that follow the adventures of the likes of Conan and Red Sonja. And I am currently enjoying various iterations of Red Sonja explored through Dynamite Comics and the re-established Conan series of comics by Marvel. And just to address, I, for some reason, prefer the Conan pronunciation rather than Conan pronunciation. For me, it just evokes the uh, the setting better. So, you know, you can have a go at me for pronunciation if you like, but it ain't going to change. On the back of that long-standing fandom, I bought these three modules when they were released, 1984 for Conan modules CB1 and CB2, and 1986 for RS1 Red Sonja Unconquered. The first two modules were released riding on the back of the second Schwarzenegger Conan movie, Conan the Destroyer, and Arnie is depicted on the covers of each. The Red Sonja module sought to capitalise on the Red Sonja movie of 1985, but no photograph of Bridget Nielsen adorns its cover. The history of the rights to the Conan and Red Sonja characters is a messy one, which I may do a video on in the future since, as a fan, I'm one of those who's had to try and keep up with that particular cesspool. But but anyway. Each of these three modules assumes that the players will take on the roles of Conan, Red Sonja and their allies, all high-level characters. Each adventure is 32 pages long and starts with some rule changes and additions for play in the Hyborian Age, equipment, fear of the supernatural and so on. After inclusion of these rules, plus some rather bland maps, with the exception of the Hyborian Age campaign map from Red Sonja Unconquered, plus pre-generated player character sheets, plus new monsters and so on, only around half of the provided booklet's pages are given over to adventures, more or less. Each is laid out as a series of plot points, events and story encounters, through which the players march to complete the tale. In other words, the modules are in the railroad camp of things. They are short, they feel hurried, 
and they do not feel like they belong to the Hyborian age, despite the name dropping of characters, people, and geography, and the rule changes for play. The first two feel as though they were rushed out of the door to coincide with the movie. The third, regarding Red Sonia, was a marginally better effort. But by that time, in 1985, TSR had released a role-playing game dedicated to Conan that did a much better job of the subject matter. I suspect that the Red Sonia module had to be released under the Dungeons and Dragons banner rather than as part of the Conan game materials due to the different licensing paths that I've already mentioned. In summary, these three modules appear here for being rushed railroad movie tie-ins that don't compare well to the setting that they are trying to represent. Number 1. WG-9, Gargoyle, WG-10, Child's Play, and WG-11, Puppets. These three modules are lumped together because they all represent the same basic premise in my mind. Kill Greyhawk. 1988 through to 1991 were rough years for Greyhawk, the world that Gygax had created for his own games, and their home to such luminary adventures as Against the Giants, The Temple of Elemental Evil and The Tomb of Horrors, among many of the early first edition offerings. By 1987, the Forgotten Realms had taken over as what can be termed the core campaign setting of the advanced Dungeons & Dragons game, with sourcebooks, box sets and adventures aplenty. Meanwhile, the last, shall we say, uh, proper offering under first edition for Greyhawk was WG6, Isle of the Ape, in 1985. And the final offering within that edition overall was the comedy pun crammed madness of WG7, Castle Greyhawk, in 1988. Between these two posts, Gygax left TSR in 1986, and his world took a definite nosedive within the halls of TSR after that point. A half hearted compilation of related adventures arrived as a crossover between first and second editions in 1989 in the form of WG8 Fate of Istus. The adventures therein were of mixed quality, and the compilation as a whole didn't really meet expectations from Greyhawk fans, which could be very simply summarised as to at least meet the quality of material arriving on the shelves for the Forgotten Realms. WG-9, Gargoyle, WG-10, Child's Play, and WG-11, Puppets, all followed in 1989, and while WG-9 does not implicitly state this, I suspect all were drawn from demonstration and tournament modules. Certainly both Child's Play and Puppets were, and state as much in their opening paragraphs. Worse still, part of Puppets was originally set within the Forgotten Realms, with a name change from, at last, Raven's Bluff, to Road to Divers, made in order to switch settings to Greyhawk. All that aside, the adventures themselves are just bloody awful. It's also fairly insulting that, in the pages of Puppets, the authors try to desperately add a mark of quality to the affair. Quote, In effect, this module has been playtested by hundreds of gamers. I wonder if any of them were asked their opinion on it. From a gamer who loved both Greyhawk and the Realms, who lapped up most of the products coming out for each, and who was therefore in a position to directly compare the two, it was obvious that the Realms were the thing, and the attitude at TSR was that Greyhawk can just go away and die. At one convention attended by TSR in the UK at the time, I asked what was happening to Greyhawk. The answer was that Greyhawk wasn't selling. My own conclusion there is that TSR wasn't interested in pushing out quality product in order for Greyhawk to sell, so therefore they were engineering their own excuse for kidding it off. Gargoyle, Child's Play and Puppet stand as evidence in that regard. Fortunately, Greyhawk lovers are a stalwart bunch, and the setting bounced back with 1991's WGS-1, five, uh, one, 5 Shall Be 1, and WGS-2, Howl from the North, part of a trilogy that was capped by the Greyhawk Wars board game, and which fed directly into 1992's revamp of 1983's World of Greyhawk box set in the form of the excellent From the Ashes. But before that happened... I truly believe the period and product carrying the Greyhawk title, released from 1988 to 1990, represents a concerted effort to expunge just that bit more of the Gygax legacy from Dungeons & Dragons. But perhaps I'm wrong, and what actually happened was that TSR and its authors just hadn't the first blind clue what to do with the setting at the time. 
Anyway, in summary, this trilogy of adventures makes the number one spot in this list for being so bad that they should have never made it to print, and that they nearly ended one of the greatest legacies within role-playing. And so that's it. My top worst adventures for Dungeons & Dragons, regardless of edition, and entirely within the domain of my own opinion. If you agree, disagree, or have any other adventures that you think should be in the worst bucket, let us all know in the comments. I have to admit that this was more fun to do than it should have been. It's one thing to come up with a list of bad things, but another to exercise to delve into why you think that they are bad. So I actually feel like I've learned something about myself here. Strange, but true. Next up on the gaming front, I am going to try and delve into the UK versus USA game mentality, perhaps visiting other nations on the way. Hopefully, it'll be a roller coaster of different foundations, influences, and mindsets that may help us gamers from different sides of different ponds understand each other better. Until then, 